no matter how calm the waters may be on the surface. Down below, with awesome power and silent fury, they can destroy the submariner and his steel vessel in a heartbeat. It's been said the sea is a more hostile environment than space. Submarines operate in an inherently dangerous environment. They operate uh, deep under the ocean, under tremendous pressures uh, from the compressed ocean water. And any mistake, any technical malfunction can potentially be fatal. You can't bail out as you might in an airplane. You can't lower the boats as you might on the surface. You can't jump off the deck of a carrier and hope to survive and get picked up. There's no place to go. Any system malfunction can potentially lead to a loss of power. If this occurs, the ship loses its maneuverability, its ability to generate breathable air, and ultimately, its ability to service. Out of power, out of control. In a worst case scenario, it sinks to its crush depth, where the structure can no longer withstand the increasing water pressure. An entire crew perishes. But this triggers a vital response within the submarine community. The basic cycle goes, that first we find out that something's gone wrong, then there's an investigation, we try to figure out why it went wrong. The investigation will lead to some sort of findings as to the root cause, and that gives us an idea as to what we need to do to try to make things better. In 1968, mindful of successes and failures, the U.S. Navy was moving ahead with its nuclear submarine program. Five years earlier, it had suffered the loss of Thresher, with all 129 men aboard. But after an investigation, it had implemented changes aimed at advancing the cause of submarine safety. On May 21st, 1968, all was well with the Scorpion, a nuclear sub with 99 men aboard. The fast attack sub had left the Mediterranean after a successful mission shadowing the Soviet fleet. It radioed its position, about 50 miles south of the Azores. But on May 22nd, it lay in pieces on the bottom of the ocean, under 10,000 feet of water, its crew of 99, all dead. The loss of the Scorpion was a huge shock because it did come after all these improvements had been made after the Thresher was lost. The story of the Scorpion is one of those painful episodes that defies the notion of closure. Many questions, few answers. There's no way of finding out what the crew was going through in the last moments of their lives. They don't have cockpit voice recorders in submarines, so there's no, really, there's no way to, to know that. The Scorpion was not in contact with people at the time that it sank. There have been rumors ranging from Russian submarines torpedoing it to a battery well explosion to a hot run in the torpedo tube that caused the torpedo to go off prematurely. Two decades later, the Navy still wanted to know what had happened to its men and their sub. It built Jason Jr., a deep sea robot, which was sent down to investigate. And sure enough, there was an explosion in the forward torpedo room. While some believe the Soviets sunk Scorpion in retaliation for one of theirs we may have sunk, the official Navy theory focuses on a faulty battery in the compartment next to the torpedo room. A now declassified Navy report from 1987 speculates that a battery explosion fits the damage to the submarine. 
There is a tremendous amount of energy stored in a submarine battery, even a small one like what we had on nuclear power boats, that could cause a fairly serious explosion. That could have triggered a subsequent explosion in the torpedo room, which would have blown a huge hole in Scorpion. It would have flooded rapidly and then sunk to its crush depth. When you puncture the, uh, the hull of a submarine at, at, at that kind of a depth, the rapid change in air pressure causes the air to ignite and essentially stuffs out everybody aboard. But at 10,000 feet on the ocean bottom, the details of Scorpion's demise may forever remain a mystery. You know, you can't go down there and look at it. Uh, you can run a submersible down there and take pictures, but you can't actually go down and touch it like you could an air crash, for example. So any submarine sinking, there's always a great deal of mystery around it. Nonetheless, the Navy forged ahead, acting on the most plausible theory explaining the Scorpion's untimely end. About a year after this submarine disaster, Naval Ordnance ordered a redesign and replacement of the torpedo battery that had been red flagged. So whether that was the cause or not, the search for an answer led to an improved technology that made subs even safer. Dive! Dive! Since the Scorpion submarine tragedy, there have been no subs lost by the U.S. in nearly 40 years. But that wasn't the case in the beginning of submarine history. The first three submarines enlisted into military service all encountered trouble. During the American Revolution, George Washington's forces included a one-man submarine called the Turtle. Its mission was to attach an explosive to a British warship in New York Harbor. It failed, although the Submariner survived. In the American Civil War, submarines were once again called into service. The Union Navy developed a sub called the Alligator, but it never saw active duty as it was lost in transport during a storm. But by far, the Civil War's most compelling submarine story centers on a Confederate vessel. On a chilly February night in 1864, eight men squeezed on board the CSS H.L. Hunley for a mission below the waters of Charleston Bay, South Carolina. Essentially, it was a, a pipe about 40 feet long, and um, the crew, the, the, the eight unfortunates who made up the motive power of the thing sat on a bench and operated a crank which turned the propeller. Despite its Spartan accommodations, the Hunley was advanced for its time. It had a rudimentary bellow system for its snorkel, diving planes, and ballast tanks. The mission of the Hunley and its crew was to sink the USS Housatonic by attaching its spar torpedo to the ship's hull. The torpedo was attached to the end of the spar and it was a copper canister filled with 75 pounds of black powder and it was attached to a barb much like a thimble so when they ran the barb into the ship and they pulled back the canister would remain and then the bar would pull out and so they would go back a hundred yards and then there was a reel on the Hunley and when they got to the end of the hundred yards that would ignite uh, the powder. That's exactly what the Hunley's crew did and when the explosion occurred just as planned the Housatonic began to sink. The Hunley had pulled off the world's first successful submarine combat mission. This much we know but the rest of the story was incomplete for over a century. Well, the mystery was that the Hunley didn't return to port. And so what happened to the Hunley? The next day, the Confederates could see the mass of the Housatonic sticking out of the water, but the Hunley never came back. Remarkably, after a 15-year quest, the Hunley was discovered in 1995 by a team of underwater archaeologists under the direction of author Clive Cussler.
special harness was designed and built for the delicate process of raising and investigating this amazing piece of history. And it was uh, about a thousand feet uh, off the Housatani. And what it turned out to be that it was waiting for the tide to turn because it didn't sink, obviously, from the explosion. And I believe that the Canandaiga, which was a ship coming to rescue the Housatani survivors who were up in the rigging, struck the Hunley and sank it. The fate of the Hunley showed that the technology was still too rudimentary and unsafe for widespread practical use. With only man-powered propulsion, the crew of the Hunley couldn't get away in time to survive. Four decades later, an inventor and entrepreneur named John Holland developed a practical vessel for the U.S. Navy that was ultimately known as the forerunner of the modern submarine. At first, steam engines were tried. While powerful, they had a drawback. The negative was that, of course, the, the thing became uh, a bo like a blast furnace. Uh, it was so hot, and the crew was, was suffered uh, accordingly. After five prototypes, Holland built the USS Holland, a six-man sub for the U.S. Navy. It featured a dual-engine system, gasoline power for surface cruising, and an electric motor for submerged travel. But these had inherent dangers. For one thing, the battery for the electric motor could explode. And if seawater got into the battery, it would produce deadly chlorine gas, the same kind of gas used in World War I in the trenches to kill enemy soldiers. But it wasn't just the batteries that posed a danger. Fumes from the internal combustion engines could also cause explosions. Gasoline explosions accounted for a number of submarines sinking in the early years of the 20th century. To deal with this, submarine engineers switched to diesel. Diesel is not highly volatile. Diesel is relatively hard to ignite, so it's a fairly safe fuel and much, much safer than, than gasoline. Still, there were many submarine disasters in the early years of the 20th century. Fire, flood, and collisions all resulted in loss of lives. When mishaps occurred, there was no rescue technology in place. That would come only after two prominent disasters inspired a visionary commander named Charles Momsen. When the USS Scorpion went down, it was armed with 23 torpedoes. Two of them nuclear-tipped. Sub-disasters will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to sub-disasters on Modern Marvels. On September 25, 1925, an American submarine, the USS S-51, collided with a cargo ship off the coast of Rhode Island and went down in 130 feet of water. Commander Charles Swede Momsen was ordered to take his sub, the USS S-1, out to search for the crippled vessel. When he found it, he soon realized there were survivors. He knew there were people alive in there. They were banging on the hull. He could hear them. And there wasn't a thing he could do for them. And there wasn't a thing they could do for themselves. They had no way of getting out the boat. Two years later, when a second sub, the USS S-4, was lost, Momsen was spurred to take action. He sees the inadequacy of the measures taken, and so he decides that they need more sophisticated equipment, and he goes on to invent two types of devices that will be very important to the saving of submarine crews in the future. In 1929, he first tested what was to become the Momsen Lung. Momsen's device was an oblong rubber bag with two tubes that recycled exhaled air. The lung contained a canister of soda lime, which removed carbon dioxide from exhaled air and then replenished it with oxygen. Soon, sailors were using the Momsen lung in disaster simulation training, in which they learned to escape from a submarine. 
The original simulation device was the tower that let submariners practice entering the water from a depth of from 50 to 100 to 150 feet and to feel what it was like and to experience what it's like to use this breathing device, the Momsen Lung, as they ascended from the depths to the surface. In 1929, the Navy then pushed for the development of a rescue chamber. Begun by Momsen and later modified by a colleague, Lieutenant Commander Alan McCann, the Navy built a large steel bell-shaped chamber which could be lowered with cables down to the escape hatch on a sunken submarine. A watertight seal to the submarine could be created by placing a rubber gasket around the diving bell's bottom and reducing the air pressure. The hatch could then be opened and the trapped submariners could climb aboard. A hatch on the top of the bell would allow the rescued submariners and diving bell operators an easy way out. They were trying to perfect ways of getting out of the submarine, but it hadn't been tried in an emergency situation. It was only a matter of time before Momsen's equipment would be put to the test. In 1939, the United States Navy launched its newest submarine, the USS Squalus. But it had new technology. It was the latest thing, and not everything was perfected. In its very first year, the USS Squalus had been refitted and was carrying out her post-refit trials off the coast of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Its problems began with a malfunction of the main induction valve, a 36-inch opening in the hull that provided air needed for the operation of the diesel engines. Just before diving, the indicator showed that it was closed and safe to submerge. But the valve was open, and that, start, that flooded out the engine room. And it happened so quickly that there was no way they could counter the effect of the inrush of water. The sub was down 243 feet below the surface. 28 men died almost immediately. 33 members of the crew, however, do survive. They're in a watertight compartment, and they release a small float with a radio telephone that floats to the surface. The captain of the Squalus tells the people on the surface that his crew survives and that they need rescue. Then the phone line is cut. So these men in these three compartments were still alive. They were far below anything that any man had ever been rescued from before. They spread soda lime out on the decks to absorb CO2 in the air. The men not actually required to do something were told to go lie down, conserve energy, and conserve oxygen. And they waited for rescue to come. When the Navy finally realized what had happened, Six agonizing hours later, a rescue party was organized under the guidance of none other than Charles Swede Momsen, who was flown in from Washington, D.C. His invention, the McCann Rescue Chamber, was to be utilized in an attempt to save all the surviving submariners. There were three compartments with air in them, but the middle compartment was the forward battery compartment. They were afraid that seawater would get into the battery and produce poison gas, so the men sealed that off. So there was the control room with half the men in it, then this empty space, and then the forward torpedo room with the other half of the men. Eventually, the worst case scenario occurred in the forward battery compartment. As water seeped into the squalus, it mixed with the acid in the batteries and produced chlorine gas. But they, they used the Momsen lung as a, as a gas mask and it was very effective. Meanwhile on the surface, the Navy had gotten its ships, men and equipment ready for the rescue. They were then able to lower the diving bell down and seal it against the, the hull and begin to carry the men up. Initially, they thought it would take five trips to bring all the men to the surface. But something told Momsen, don't play it safe. So he had them overload the bell and get them up in four trips instead of five. On the fourth trip, the cable bringing them up broke. The bell was cast loose. It had one thin strand left. 
they got 50 or so crewmen to hold the cable and pull it up by hand. If he'd gone with five missions instead of four, the last group of men would have been left trapped on the bottom with no way out. It's a spectacular success for the U.S. Navy, and it's a true testament to the U.S. Navy's valuable investment in rescue technology. All the equipment was right there on hand to be used, and it, it had been developed and was ready to go and the experienced personnel were available to make it work. The rescue was also a victory for Charles Momsen. Momsen was an innovator. He was a true believer. He was the kind of person who makes a real difference. When he came along, nobody had ever been rescued from a sunken sub. Nobody thought it was possible. And he said, I'm going to change that. And he did. Eventually, the Squalus was raised, refloated, repaired, and recommissioned as the USS Sailfish. Improvements in submarine systems ensured that the malfunctions that initially put the Squalus at risk would not reoccur. But the world's superpowers would soon be involved in a Cold War that would push submarine technology beyond any previous limits of safety. The Squalus could travel 20 knots on the surface, 9 knots submerged. She'd made 18 successful test dives on the day she sank. Some disasters will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Sub Disasters on Modern Marvels. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in an escalating and frightening arms race. It was the nuclear age, and during the 1960s, both sides seemed on the brink of annihilating one another, if not the world. This was the same era as the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Crisis. People thought there was going to be a nuclear war with Russia, and every new piece of military technology was vital. What this meant was that things were rushed into service real quick. And that included submarines, which were also entering the nuclear age. A nuclear-powered sub was more efficient and could remain below the water's surface longer and therefore remain undetected for longer periods of time. With a nuclear plant, your submarine could go as long as the, the groceries last. That's your only limitation. That could be up to six months. And it stays tight. And it's fast. It added up to a war machine that could secretly get closer to enemy territory than ever before. And then launch its missiles, if it came to that. So when submarines switched to nuclear power plants, as with the Nautilus, and soon afterwards started carrying nuclear weapons, the magnitude of potential disasters increased exponentially. It's been a deadly game. The Russians have lost five nuclear subs, and the U.S. has lost two. In every case, all men aboard have perished. The story of the U.S. Navy's Thresher is a painful chapter from the Cold War era. The fast attack sub was the 15th nuclear sub launched and the lead ship of the permit class. Early in the morning of April 10, 1963, the sub was on a test dive off the coast of Cape Cod, accompanied by the U.S. rescue ship Skylark. It was going to what's called test depth, which is the maximum safe depth that a submarine can sail at. And it was in constant contact with the surface as it went through this dive. But at one point, Thresher signaled a message that it was having minor problems. This would be the last contact with the sub. My guess would be that the people on board were working through these things, that there was probably not a lot of panic, that they were just trying harder and harder to save things until they realized that they couldn't. The Navy would later conclude that the trouble began the previous summer 
when Thresher had suffered some damage to 28 joints on its piping during shock testing. Others speculated that an earlier collision with a tugboat was another possible culprit. In either case, during Thresher's dive to test depth, a joint on a small pipe began to let water in. Which immediately shorted out some electrical controls, which controlled the nuclear reactor. And when that shorted out, the reactor shut down. Out of power, the sub could no longer communicate with rescue ship Skylark. At this point, it began to sink. Submarines work like airplanes. As they move through the water, they have a certain buoyancy that helps them keep up. When they lost power, it started sinking. And it was already at test depth, the maximum safe depth. The emergency blow system could have helped them to surface. But it too failed. This is a process in which compressed air is directed to different sections of the sub in order to control surfacing and diving. The way that the emergency blow system was set up then was going through relatively narrow pipes with a lot of turns that went through pressure reducing valves and the system froze up so they couldn't get high pressure air into the ballast tanks to blow the water out and they had no way to get to the surface. The men must have been aware of trouble but just kept trying to save the vessel. They knew something was happening. They didn't know, probably didn't know what it was exactly. They were probably doing their jobs as they were trained to do them. But before the men could restore the electrical circuits, Thresher sank to crush depth. When they get to crush depth, what happens is the sea pressure so quickly crushes the submarine. It gives way all at once. The air is compressed so quickly and so intensely that it bursts into flames. So the men on those submarines didn't die of drowning. They were burnt to death. In fact, they were incinerated in a burst of light. One hundred and twenty-nine men lost their lives that morning. They went down with their sub to the ocean bottom at some 8,000 feet. In the submarine community, it was a shock. It was a shock quite different from the shock it presented to the families and relatives of the lost crewmen. It shouldn't have happened. It's the sort of thing that's not supposed to happen. We found out that we weren't perfect, you know, that we hadn't learned as much about submarine design as we thought, and that we could still lose even the newest boats. Thresher's nuclear reactor was not damaged in the disaster and remains intact at the bottom of the sea. Furthermore, there are no lost nuclear weapons as she was on a test mission and not armed. The Thresher tragedy led to a number of changes aimed towards averting disaster. The implementation of better safety standards in nuclear subs, a means of restarting the nuclear reactor in case of emergency, and a redesign of the ballast blow tank system. So you had large diameter pipes that did not reduce the pressure, that just blew high pressure air into the ballast tanks to blow the water out to get you up to the surface in a hurry. When Thresher plunged its sailors to the sub's crush depth, there was as yet no technology to rescue a downed sub that was far below sea level, but that hadn't reached its breaking point. The Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicles, or DSRVs, were created as a, as a direct result of the loss of Thresher in April of 1963. The Navy realized that even if Thresher had gone down in an area of the ocean which would permit access to her, we did not have the technology to go down that far, even that far, and bring the crew back to the surface to safety. The U.S. Navy developed electrically powered DSRVs. These can rescue up to 24 men at a time. Loaded up on a C-5 transport plane, they can get to a sub in distress in any ocean in a matter of hours. In fact, they can even be piggybacked on another submarine. They have cradles made for them that allow them to be piggybacked on another submarine. Once the DSRV locates the disabled sub, it uses its special docking system. The black and white ring seen here mates with the upper escape trunk hatch of the sub in distress. Then the men are taken out of the sub in groups and brought by the DSRV to another sub or a surface vessel. Unfortunately, in the year 2000, 
Even DSRVs would be too little too late for the men aboard the Russian submarine, Kursk. The thresher broke up into six major sections, with debris scattered over 400 yards square. Some disasters will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to sub-disasters on Modern Marvels. In over 40 years of involvement with nuclear submarines, the Russians suffered the loss of five vessels and hundreds of lives. While the U.S. certainly made its share of mistakes, it hasn't lost a nuclear sub in nearly 40 years. So why the disparity? Communism did not reward people for doing good work, as a result of which there wasn't any point in doing good work, work and as a result of that, they got a lot of bad work. The theoretical people were world class, and still are. But unless you can tighten the nut on a bolt, you don't have things break. During the Cold War, both the U.S. and Soviets were hurrying new technology into service. The U.S. paid the price with the losses of Thresher and Scorpion. And the Soviets suffered in this deadly game as well. They were rushing to catch up, and they cut corners. In addition, because of the Soviet environment, decisions were made politically. Mistakes could mean the end of a career, even the end of a life. So people did not report mistakes. And it bit them hard in, in engineering that they couldn't produce quality goods to deal with a specific task. And that cost a lot of lives for the Soviets. Today, the Kursk has the painful distinction of being Russia's most famous lost nuclear sub. The tragic events began August 12, 2000. Kursk was on exercise in the Barents Sea, and she disappeared. She had been scheduled to fire practice torpedoes at the Russian service ships as an exercise. Our hydrophones and any submarines we had in the area picked up a big explosion, and then the Russians started looking for a lost submarine. And that was really all that we knew. A second explosion registered a 3.5 on the Richter scale, the equivalent of the detonation of 1.5 tons of explosives. The Russians knew this unfolding disaster hadn't gone unnoticed, but didn't alert world media until nearly 48 hours after the event. They were not very forthcoming right off the bat, which is understandable. It's embarrassing to lose a nuclear submarine. A Russian admiral went on television declared that Kursk had suffered technical failures, had sunk, and that in all likelihood, there were no survivors. While there were 118 men aboard, there were in fact 23 survivors, desperate to be rescued. The Kursk was in shallow waters, only 354 feet below the surface. Immediately, other nations, including the U.S. and Great Britain, offered help. But the Russians rejected any assistance. They would do it on their own. I don't think that there was ever any chance of those men being rescued. The Russians were far too slow getting their resources on the sea. Had everybody had the right equipment, online and ready to go at that very moment. Maybe somebody might have survived. But that requires about four consecutive miracles. And emergencies happen at unexpected times. That's why they're called emergencies. In October 2001, the Russians, aided by the Dutch, raised the Kursk and removed her nuclear reactor and weapons. What caused the sinking of the Kursk? A Russian commission concluded the most likely cause for the explosion was a collision with another sub. They based this on two facts. First, the long and deep scratch marks along the side of Kursk. Secondly, the USS Memphis was tracked in the area at the time of the disaster, and shortly afterwards, docked in nearby Norwegian waters for emergency repairs, the nature of which has never been disclosed.
While this theory is tantalizingly plausible, the U.S. categorically rejects it and insists the Russians were using a dangerously volatile fuel. What appears to have sunk the Kursk was a defective torpedo fueled with HTP fuel, high test peroxide. It would appear that this torpedo was damaged to the degree that some of the fuel leaked out of the torpedo onto the deck. When HTP gets on steel and oil, it explodes. What really caused this disaster will probably never be ascertained. But the bottom line is this. Had those sailors had equipment to help them breathe, they could have possibly survived until rescue crews got to them. They had atmosphere cleansing equipment back there of some kind. The Russian equivalent of an oxygen generator and a, a CO2 absorption unit to clean the atmosphere. It seems that in an attempt to get this equipment going, they started a small fire which depleted the oxygen in the compartment and rendered the machinery useless. So they were, regrettably, they were pretty well doomed. To this day, six nuclear submarines, four Russian and two American, remain on the ocean bottom. They have nuclear power plants and an estimated 44 nuclear warheads, some on torpedoes, some on missiles. Navy officials and nuclear scientists claim there is little to be concerned about. The chance of an explosion is nearly impossible, and environmental contamination is also of little concern. Thus far, radioactive levels near the wrecks are negligible. Zero reading on the Geiger counter. The lost subs at the bottom of the sea will no doubt persist as grim reminders of what can go wrong in a submarine. But instead of looking back, navies around the world look forward to what they can do to prevent disaster. In the area of emergency operating procedures, simulators provide the best training. A special Dutch barge used 26 steel cables to pull the wreckage of the 18,000 ton course from the bottom of the Barents Sea. Sub-disasters will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Sub-Disasters on Modern Marvels. While submarines are far safer today than ever before, they nonetheless operate on the edge of survivability. Danger is never eliminated, only managed. Engineers continually seek to improve the technology, and navies stress the importance of training submariners in emergency operating procedures. The crew has to react immediately and instinctively. If you've gone through realistic disaster drills, you're not likely to be scared and frozen in place during those critical first seconds when survival, maybe for the entire sub, is dependent on what each individual does. Today, submarining has become a much safer occupation because the disasters that have happened in the past, we have learned a very great deal about what can happen and how to prevent it from happening. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, the Canadian Navy trains its submariners with simulators to deal with the very kinds of trouble they experienced when a fire broke out in October of 2004 on the HMCS Shikudami, killing a sailor. Simulators recreate the submarine environment in three dimensions. Equipped with flexible motion platforms and computer-generated virtual systems, simulators provide a realistic experience. 
Simulators are able to reproduce with amazing accuracy situations that are critical underwater that might endanger the life of the submarine and this crew. So the reality level at which the training is conducted is very, very high. You can feel what it's like to fail and know that you're dead and then come back and feel what it's like to succeed and know that you've saved your own life and probably that of your crew. Full dive on the planes, two down. Simulator scenarios are all set up in the facilitator operating console. From here we can control the majority of the uh, faults and systems in the simulator. I'm actually going to trip the forward MG, a motor generator which provides half the electricity, AC electricity on the submarine. The loss of the motor generator will complicate an emergency go deep scenario in which the men have to rapidly dive the sub in order to avoid collision with a surface vessel. In another training area, an engineer deals with the same emergency, but instead of controlling the sub, he's working with the engine. Sixty-five meters, ten meters deep, two up, three up. Gauge four planes. Gauge four planes. Four planes extended. Very good. The emergency is over. The men have reacted to the situation with skill and confidence. In another part of the world, on a real submarine, sailors stay keenly focused on their tasks and take nothing for granted. Clearly, with training and rescue technology developed to such a high degree, submarines are safer than ever before. And while there will always be risks and unforeseen incidents, there will be men who are willing, even eager, to sign on for this special assignment. The submariner is considered the elite, so I think it's the, uh, the romance of a submarine is what really attracts uh, men to, to serve on a submarine. And just as the sea seems limitless, so do the possibilities for submariners. The ocean, and under the ocean, the sea bottom, is the last great unexplored territory on Earth. The technology that's been developed to put those submarines to sea, to keep them there, and to make them safe, is going to be technology that will be applied to the future exploration of that vast sea bottom. Every disaster has triggered new technology, new answers, and a new commitment to make sure that if a man survives in a submarine disaster for even a little while, that he can be rescued. As for those men who lost their lives, those twisted wrecks in which they lie are a poignant tribute to the daring and courage of what we've come to know as the silent. There is a treasure map on the back of the, the Declaration of Independence. National treasure, history, or Hollywood. We sent our own historians to investigate. There is something on the back of the Declaration of Independence. Nicholas Cage in a special interview. It's not a history lesson, but it might make you interested. History versus Hollywood, National Treasure. Next, on the History Channel.